Hey guys, some of you are already sending me messages about success, which means you are already feeling the pain of packing meat out on your backpack. That's awesome. But before it gets too crazy, I wanted to get out some tips that have helped me over the years as I've packed out heavy meat loads in my backpack. Packing meat out is one of those things on wilderness hunts that you conveniently forget about. The memory just just fades. You forget it because it's straight up misery. Happy misery, yeah, but it's still misery. You can make it easier on yourself and the longevity of your tendons and joints if you implement a few strategies that I'm gonna discuss in this video. Throughout the video, I'm gonna give you direct advice on pack manipulation, ways to properly pack meat, capes, etc. But stick around to the end of the video because I'm going to give you some important strategy advice that'll save you from miserable pack out. That advice can even get you out of some dangerous situations. I'm also gonna throw in a bunch of pictures from my and my old crew's meat pack outs. Those pictures will give you real world explanations of the good things, the bad things, the ugly things that we did over the years, right? And hopefully you can learn from those. This is stuff that has worked for me, but I would not call it conventional wisdom. A matter of fact, a bunch of people are gonna disagree with me on some of the overarching themes in this video. But again, it has worked for me. Look at me guys, I'm 160 pounds of just plain out skinny, right? I'm not exactly Paul Bunyan. I've got some pains here and there, but I've packed out a lot of meat as a guide and I'm still functioning. I've also never had a piece of game meat go bad or a cape slip. If you like the videos, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, and get on my newsletter at pursuitwithcliff.com. It helps me out a ton, guys. All right, guys, so I'm gonna demonstrate with my pack here. The first thing I'm gonna show you is how I fit in my pack, the shoulder straps, belt, etc. I don't think it is just about getting things fitted correctly one time. It's really about understanding what each adjustment does. How to manipulate those adjustments on the fly is key, particularly when you've got a heavy load on a long duration hike. You wanna learn how to shift the weight to different parts of your body. In my opinion, there's no magic, you know, 30% in your shoulders, 70% in your hips, 50-50 or whatever ratio. There really isn't a magic number. Once you are in a couple miles on a heavy load, 75 pounds or more, you're going to want to shift that weight, right, away from the pain points. Rest those points and then rotate the weight back to those points. A lot of guys just chronically tighten everything up. This tends to result in intense back pain and shoulder pain. A lot of the weight ends up on your shoulders and you get a lot of pins and needles in the middle of your back. All right guys, so I put on my pack here, okay. And what I'll do first is I'll just loosen everything up. I'll loosen my load lifters up. I'll loosen my shoulders up, my shoulder straps up a little bit. And then I start with my belt, okay. I like a belt that I can pull to tighten like this. For me, it's a lot easier, okay. Um, Because I can set it in the right spot and then hammer down and I'll be right where I need it. So what I do is first I get rid of any belt I'm wearing. It's kind of a key deal, particularly if you've got a bunch of weight, you got to get rid of any underbelt. That was not supposed to be part of the video, but but as I did that, I realized like that ain't going to work. But get rid of any belt you have on, snug up your pants, and then take your waist belt of your pack. And what I do, particularly with a heavy pack, is I bend over at my hips you know, just like this, just like maybe like 20 degrees or something like that. And what I'm, what I'm shooting for here is I want the mid part of my, uh, my waist belt to be on the point of my hip, okay? So basically, you know, 40, 50% of the waist belt is above the point of the hip here and the rest is below. It's basically catching that hip, all right? So what I'll do here, I'll get there and then as I've got the weight tipped on that, so it's not sliding back down, I'll just snug this up on my waist belt, okay? All right, so that's my waist belt adjustment. Now, generally, because all your other stuff is loose, your pack's gonna be leaning back a little bit. And so at this point, what I'll do is I'll just snug up my load lifters a little bit just to get the load up and down, okay? Here, you can see that. And the problem here is you can see space right here, right? You don't want that, all right? You wanna, you're gonna wanna adjust these shoulder straps until you get rid of that. You can take your load lifters off. And basically what you're looking for is you're looking for the contour of this strap to just be barely touching, touching your, your, uh, your whole curve of your shoulder, okay? 
And essentially what my kind of steady state pack deal is my load lifters are coming off the pack into you know these little points of contacts on my shoulder, like let's say roughly 40, 45 degrees, maybe between 35 and 45 degrees right there. And then I've got just soft contact across the whole curve of my shoulders. I can feel it a little a just smidge right here on the backs of my shoulders here. I've got the pack leaning up. It's not lay laying back like this, you know, hanging way back. This can be a real big problem when you're packing meat, particularly capes, ram's heads, that sort of thing. You've got to fight, you've got to combat that, uh, that weight going back like that and kind of all the time, even when you're getting it on. So you tend to maybe keep those load lifters a little bit tight, particularly when you first start going. And as you do that, you see it'll pull it up, pull it up, up your shoulders, okay? So that's not really like the steady state. The steady state is you want nice contact, okay? So now, we're gonna jump into reality, right? As you start hiking and carrying a bunch of weight through terrain, what you're gonna find is you're gonna find certain parts of your body start to fatigue and you wanna take the weight off of that part of your body and put it on another uh, part of your body. So you can't just have your pack fitted and this is how you work. You need to really know how to manipulate the pack, okay? So if you wanna have more weight on your hips, basically take these shoulder straps and loosen them up, okay? So now I've got these pretty loose. I've basically gone from probably like, you know, 40, 60, you know, 60% 60 shoulders, 40% hips. Now I'm basically 80% hips, 20% shoulders, okay? And you can see that, all right? So now I've got the shoulder straps loose. Yeah, there's a little bit of room here. And really where I'm feeling contact is right here. All this strap is doing between it and the load lifters is just helping the pack from not going back like that and me losing my balance. But right now I've got it almost all on my hips, okay? So if I'm starting to get pain in my shoulders as I pack heavy weight out or in the center of my back, that's another big one, okay? Um, you, you can use this little strap and that will help. Might screw up my little microphone here. But that, that might help a little bit of that center back pain that you're gonna get. It's kind of like a pins and needle pain. A lot of people get that. Um, but what you wanna do is here, if you start getting that pain, you can drop it to your hips, right? And go that way and you can manipulate that. Now. What's gonna happen is now you've got all that weight, you've got 80, 90, 100 pounds sitting on your hips. Now what you're gonna do is you've gotten into that mode. If you go long enough, you're gonna end up getting pain on the points of your hips, okay? So you're gonna wanna shift some back to your shoulders. The best way to do that is to just snug these up and you can feel it pick up some of the weight and your shoulders are gonna pick up some of the weight and it's pulling some of the weight off your hips. You can readjust, you know, your, your uh, your load lifters a little bit, and you're gonna feel that balance point like when it starts going off, and you can just adjust those back, back on like this, okay? And what's gonna happen when you get, when you start shifting a lot of weight back up on your shoulders, you are gonna have a little lift here because a lot of that weight is going right here on your uh, shoulder strap, so you lose a little bit of that efficiency with the wrap here, but that's just a function of the fact you're taking the majority of the weight off your hips and throwing it up here, all right? So you can see here, like take these off some more. Now I'm back to my hips, okay? Now I'm back to my shoulders. I can adjust this a little bit here. If you're using this kind of like, I don't know what you're gonna call this, like a, a, like a breast bone, bone strap or whatever, you've gotta adjust it so it doesn't end up in your neck. Uh, if you've got layers on or something, this can be a little bit annoying. Like mine's probably just a smidge high on this pack right now. Um, but you want it right here below your clavicle in here and that's just going to keep Basically the point of it is to keep these in here. It's not really it shouldn't be holding a tremendous amount of tension Okay, so that gives you an idea guys. Yeah, the steady state is follow that curvature have your pack upright But if you want more weight on your hips Loosen those shoulder straps up. You can just check your load lifters You might have to lift them a little bit here to get that weight back up and down. Okay, if you want the weight back on your shoulders, just crank it back on your shoulders. And then here, now that those shoulder straps pull that weight forward, you can just release those load lifters a little bit, okay? So that's kind of the back and forth. When I have a heavy load, guys, the reality is the whole way down the mountain, I'm doing that. I'm going, you know, more shoulders, more hips, more, more hips, less shoulders. I'm changing that all the time just based on my pain points, okay? And it varies a little bit every time. Sometimes my middle of my back hurts, sometimes my hip hurt, hips hurt more, just depends. Cycling the weight around helps me a lot. A lot of guys are gonna disagree with that, 
but for me personally, that's the best way to do it. Learn how to manipulate that weight, move it up and down your back, move it to your hips, move it to your shoulders. These adjustments work pretty handily and you'll get a, you'll get a sixth sense. Now, what I mentioned before is a lot of guys, what they do as they go, the weight just starts to shimmy down, particularly if they don't have much hips, they're a skinny little guy like me. Um, and what they do is they just crank on everything, right? They crank their load lifters. They crank their shoulders, right? They crank their belt. And what this does is it puts a tremendous amount of tension on your back, right? And it lifts these way up. And what ends up happening is you end up with a lot of like, you know, under your scapula and back pain, and it becomes miserable after a while. You gotta try to avoid that. So don't just crank on everything. Really learn how to shift that weight uh, from your hips to your shoulders and just go back and forth and adjust that ratio as you go down the mountain. As you go down the mountain, particularly if you don't have real pronounced hips, what you're gonna end up doing is the pack's gonna end up wanting to shimmy down your hips and you're gonna lose that contact around your hip bones. The best way to adjust that I find when you've got a heavy pack is essentially loosen your pack up, let it set on your shoulders, or you know, just pivot at your hips, hinge your hips, keep the weight up high, loosen your belt, Okay, reset that belt right on the point of your hips, basically 50-50, and tighten that puppy down, and then bring it back up and reset the belt. I have to do that a lot on heavy pack outs. Okay, so now that you understand the idea of that you can move around the weight with these packs, you gotta kinda be able to recognize, you know, how, okay, if this part of my body is hurting, where should I shift the weight? So I'll kinda go through the scenarios that I've kinda figured out over time, I would guess that they apply to most body types. They may be a little bit different, but this is what's worked for me, guys. All right, so if my upper back and shoulders are killing me, right? I've got those little pins and needles between my shoulders, in my shoulders. I drop the weight to my hips. The way I do that is release the shoulder uh, straps a little bit and then use these load lifters to just get the pack back up a little bit upright and that'll put 90 95 percent of the weight on my hips and it'll relieve my shoulders and let there be a little mobility now if my hip points start to hurt like basically they feel like they're getting burned raw or my quads are burning you know my upper legs just start to kill me or if i start to feel a stacking feeling in my hip joint when that happens i'll put some more weight back on my shoulders and the way to do that is tighten up my shoulder straps right and then loosen up my load lifters a little bit to keep that weight upright, all right? And guys, that, that hip stacking feeling, that's the way to describe it. It's like a real compression in your hips. You gotta be a little wary of that. Don't let it get out of hand because it kinda, I think it fundamentally is just kinda crushing your hips into your knees, into your ankles. So you gotta watch that. I find that that's one of the hardest things for me to deal with once it starts. So when you start to feel that stacking feeling, make sure to kick some weight back up on your shoulders, right? And then back up on your shoulders, you know, not necessarily here. You're gonna have some pain on, you know, on your shoulders where you're carrying some weight where there's contact. You're gonna have to deal with that. But when you start to get those pins and needles and the back aches in your back, then you need to shift a little bit back to your hips. Those are generally the rules of thumb that I use with heavy weight going downhill. Let's say that I'm doing a five mile pack out just straight out of drainage. Just so you get a feel of how many times I adjust the weight. For the first one or two miles, I might adjust one or two times. Now, the next mile, I might adjust, I might adjust four or five times. Then the next mile, I'm adjusting like 10 times. And then the last mile or the last mile and a quarter, I might adjust 20 times, okay? I can do it while moving, it's not a big deal. You'll get a feel for it and I think it'll really help you if you're capable of doing that. All right guys, so that's a basic outline on travel, right? But before we load up this pack and I get into the nitty gritty of that, you know, how to actually strap meat to a pack, all of those little things, I wanna talk about a couple things. First guys, I always use trekking poles. This is a great way to save your knees, all right? Even though mine are basically ruined, it'll, it'll keep the longevity of it up, okay? So I used to use like an ax handle pole, like a whippet, and that allowed me to use one pole where I could stop my weight going downhill like this with my palm out like that, okay? Now I use two poles, just your standard trekking poles. It's slightly better and it's relief on both knees as you go downhill. The compression on impact on the downhill becomes unbearable if you don't mitigate it with trekking poles, right? Or walking sticks, whatever. For a more in-depth discussion of trekking poles and walking sticks, you can check out my older video on walking sticks, just a dedicated video. I'll stick a link up here, you can check that out. 
The other video you can check out is the, the video, uh, 10 things I always carried while, while guiding for the last decade. Um, you can see that video, I talk about trekking poles a little bit in depth there. But the quick and dirty on it when it comes to trekking poles is you wanna use your poles on every step. Some guys don't realize it, but they're using their sticks only once it's too late, okay? From the beginning of a meat pack out in particular, you want to use your poles on each step. I have no medical clue what the hell I'm talking about here, but your knees seem to be like your boots and the insoles in there, right? Once you do enough impact just on an individual trip and you get them flat, those $500 boots feel like you're walking on the top of a chunk of plywood you're screwed, right? There's no bounce in there, it's just not coming back. Your insoles are toast, right? Well, the same goes for your knees and hips. It seems to me like on these heavy pack out, once all the soft tissue or whatever down there gets impacted, you are in for a pain train, right? You're not gonna recover. If you minim minimize that impact from the start, you can postpone the pain train. And maybe you can even avoid it on some pack outs. But the key is to early on start to mitigate that impact. Trekking poles are a great way to do that. And guys, hold out to the end of the video and I'll talk about this more. Reality for me is I rarely went uphill with a loaded pack for prolonged periods, rarely. Hence the wear and tear on the knees was from downward impact. You gotta try to mitigate that with your sticks and how you walk. Don't wail into the next step, right? Don't flop on your knees and stuff. I see guys do that early on. They get excited, they're loaded up, and they start just bouncing down the hill. That's horrible for you, and you pay for it on the back end. What you do early will bite you in the ass on the home stretch when it comes to, to trekking downhill with a bunch of meat in your pack and a bunch of weight. Now, on resting, okay, so most people think about packing meat as an endurance feat. There's some truth to that, but in a lot of ways, it's really just a pain tolerance feat. I don't care how great your pack is and how big of a stud you think you are, carrying 100 pounds of bullshit capes, antlers, and bloody meat is going to leave you with a body that has pain points. This isn't imaginary symmetry land, right? Your pack's not going to be perfect. Hot spots on your hips, back and shoulder twinges, neck pain, welcome to the party. You're going to have those on these pack outs. So what you realize in the context of resting is that the bigger issue is time loaded and it's actually less about the distance. Hence, standing and resting is just as bad, if not worse, than just moving at a steady, bearable pace. You really have to watch this concept if you have lightly loaded guys or clients with you and you're packing out meat. They might wanna stop and rest a lot more than is optimal for you. For them, the balance is more of an endurance feat, right? A brief stop is really valuable to them. However, for the heavy loaded guys, the pain associated with the load outweighs the endurance element. So a stop can actually be negative, right? Because you're still, you're still experiencing that pain and you're doing wear and tear as you're loaded even if you stop. Now if I do stop, and you will need to make stops for all sorts of obvious reasons, I try to get my load posted up on things, you know, against a tree, over a log, anything like that. One thing guys, when you're resting with a really heavy pack, be wary of this pose, right, okay? I call this the like hate my life pose. A lot of guys will do this with a really heavy pack. And, it's a, and it feels like a good intuitive way to rest. So this is fine, right? This is a lot like how I adjust my weight belt. I basically hinge at the hips, this is fine. But don't get where you're arched way over and you've got your pack kind of at your hips or below. What happens is when guys pop back up, they can hurt their back, right? Because a lot of times they actually curve their spine when they do that and they get up like this. And if you have a really heavy pack, that's a great way to screw up your lower back on one of these trips, which can be a straight up disaster, okay? So just be wary of that. I actually think one of the best ways to rest with a big heavy pack on if you can't find somewhere to, to lay it on and kind of for it to bear the waist is keep the pack on and just get down, sit, sit on your butt and then just lay on the pack, you know, nuts to the sky and rest that way. That way you still got the pack on. You don't have to do a bunch of, you know, readjusting and have somebody help you lug the pack back on your back. You can just roll over to all fours and get up correctly. And I'll show you how to get up here in a second. All right, guys, so let's load this up. I'm going to show you how I load this with a mock meat bag just so you get the concept. Then what I'll do is I'll do a voiceover, a bunch of those meat pack out pictures that I mentioned before. And in some of the pics 
to have great loads, other times not so much. So I'll run you through all that stuff. I think you guys will kind of find it interesting. It was fun to critique myself over the years because I could actually kind of remember the pain of certain loads because I packed them so horribly or they turned out so bad. And then I remember stuff that wasn't so bad. So it's kind of interesting to go back and look at those pictures. I hope you guys find it interesting. I happen to have a smaller bag on here now, but I've actually packed a lot of meat uh, with this particular 22 mag. Um, but you're much bigger, uh, higher cubic uh, inch uh, packs. One thing you can do with them that's different is if you're only packing meat out, there's no harm in actually putting the meat into the bag, right? Just put it in a garbage bag. If you're only gonna be packing it for an hour and a half, two hours, something like that, uh, as long as you've got the meat cooled down beforehand, it'll be fine in a garbage bag as you go down the mountain. And I find that if you actually pack the meat inside the bag, it'll actually ride better in general, okay? The only thing is, is you still wanna get the weight up your back, right? You wanna have more than 60% of it above mid back line, right? So you can use straps to accomplish that, put the meat in there and then strap it down and keep the meat up high. You don't want that diaper, you know, loaded diaper syndrome that I always talk about and have the meat hanging down here on your waist belt. But anyways, I'll show you how I, I, I typically load meat when I'm not using my uh, actual bag. I'll load it between the bag and the pack frame, okay? So the first thing you've gotta do is you've gotta loosen up everything that you've got holding your pack on here, right? Okay, so I've got all, all my straps loose and then I've gotta go back here to the pack frame. This will, this is a Kafaru pack, but you know, it'll, you know, other packs are gonna be, operate pretty similar. You're gonna have to take your load lifters off Okay, and then what you'll, what you'll do is you need to get the frame, the bag off the top of your frame, okay? So I tend to get my load lifters pushed through, so I'm not dealing with them right now. And different packs will have different mechanisms, even newer Kafaru packs have a different setup up on the top here you can deal with. So I'll loosen that up and then I come down here where my pack attaches and I'll loosen it up here so I can pull it off the top. The way I have this pack set up is a little unique. It's actually very easy to do that. Um, for some packs, you'll actually have to take the clips off the bottom in order to get them off the top of the frame. Okay, so now I've got the frame off. I've got a spot there to put my meat. I'm gonna go ahead, thread my load lifters back in just real loosely. And that's how they're gonna go down the mountain like that, right? And one of the issues you can see right now, I've already talked about and I'll talk about more, is now you don't have those load lifters holding this weight. So you've got to work extra hard to keep the weight centered, you know, uh, more than 50% of the weight up high, but as closest to your back as possible. You don't want a bunch of weight sagging back here, okay? On some pack, you can just completely pull the pack off your frame. This pack, I can do that by unthreading these uh, these these straps, but that's pretty inconvenient because I gotta rethread them. I'm just gonna open it up here where I've got a gap between the two, and then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take my fake quarter here, and I'm gonna set it down. Now, one of the problems that you're gonna see, guys, if it's boned out meat in particular, it's gonna wanna squirt out the bottom of your pack. So what you're gonna wanna do is, once you lay this back down, you're gonna wanna push the meat up and really cinch down on your straps to keep that weight that weight up high. Make sure any structured meat, so really if it's bone in, then like your, you know, obviously if you've got bone in the meat, then put that down in the pack first because whenever you crank on it with straps and try to get that weight above center line, a, a structured chunk of meat, either something with a bone in it or the bigger hunks of boned out meat, like a boned out hindquarter, that sort of thing, put that in first because that structure is gonna allow you to get that weight up. As a general rule, I like to have 60 to 70% of my weight above the mid pack line, right? And that's gonna avoid that meat getting down there on your hips and sagging down towards the bottom of your, of your pack and screwing with your balance and making you just uncomfortable and miserable the whole time, right? And that's gonna keep a lot of the weight towards the pack, right, against your back. And that's what you want. You want it kind of high and close close as close to your center of gravity as possible so right here mid back you want most of the weight right there the problem is is 
this stuff like capes, antlers, you know, ram's heads, uh, tenderloins and back straps, kind of a slop. You gotta get that on top. If you put that down in the bottom, it's gonna just shimmy its way down and it's gonna screw up that weight distribution, right? So slop on top, structured stuff first so you can get it cranked up. That's the general rule of thumb here. Okay guys, so once I have it in here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull on it a little bit as I drop the pack back down, okay, like this, all right? And then the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reset my gear on top. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get, hopefully I have an auto locking strap on here, any strap will work, but something you can really crank on. I'm gonna take that and that's the first thing I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna crank hard on it, guys. Like you gotta basically use all your might possible. Hard, all you can do. Straddle the pack, whatever you can do to get that thing tight and keep that weight up, okay? So you're gonna see here, now when I lift it up, the meat stays up. If you lift up your pack and that meat sloughs down, it's not even close to tight enough, okay? You gotta have that right there really snug, okay? And then I have this little pouch I put on here. I'll do that next. I'm working kind of the bottom of my pack now to close off any opportunity for that meat to shimmy down. And the way I do that is just close off the gap in the between the pack and the frame down here by your waist belt okay so now you can see that weight is hold, hold up here tight i'll do my top straps snug it down real good here i'm not going to go as crazy because i don't want to push the meat down but again all my lower straps i'll crank those back on to make sure i've got a lot of pressure here to keep that weight distributed high you can see that there guys the weight is up high. You can see right here, there's actual space, but I've got it basically closed off with my pack, right? I've got it tight enough down here where that meat can't slough down. That's what you're going for when you're packing meat. A lot of the weight you want right here, you know, mid to upper, chunk, upper part of the frame, you want the majority of your weight, right? Not all of it, but say 65, 70%. That would be ideal, you know, you can get away with 60%, but keep it up here, all right? Guys, particularly if you have boned out meat and your plan is to be packing out boned out meat, get a good strap, have an extra strap or one on your pack that you can really snug down to split that meat and push the majority of it high, okay? A lot of times that means the auto locking strap, that kind of ratcheting feature, lets you really capture your progress and get that thing snug. You don't always have to have it on your pack, but stick it in a pocket, have it so you can use it when you're packing meat out. You can throw it in your kill kit, whatever. Guys, just a couple thoughts on other setups I see. The low shelf things you see on packs, I think those are dumb, right? Because I'm never gonna have my weight sitting down there low on my belt, okay? If you've got quarters that got bones in, you got ball joints to deal with, you might have sharp stuff, you might have some bones hanging out, any of that stuff. It, and all that stuff, one, it can tear up your pack, it can tear you up, so you gotta be careful how you set it in there. The other thing it can do is it can push the weight distribution out away from your back, right? And the thing is, guys, like particularly if you're hauling some camp gear and this pack here has weight in it, you have to be really careful about getting your weight way out here, all right? So if you've got ball joints, generally what I do is I turn them out, right? So I'll have the ball joint face this way, and that way I can get the flat side of the quarter against my back. Okay? If you've got something that's got like a chunk of ribs or something like that on it, that's gonna push the weight away from the backboard of your frame, turn it around so the weight is against your frame, okay? And the sharp stuff and anything that pushes that mass away from your body is faced this way. Right here I'll say, just take your time when you're first loading it, even if it's dark or whatever. You really don't wanna unload your pack and readjust things. You gotta be meticulous in the beginning to keep the weight right. Once you start going downhill, you really just wanna get home when you're talking about packing these heavy loads. All right, guys, I'm gonna hit on a few things by species when it comes to head antlers capes, all right? So when we're talking full body capes, we're generally talking about mountain goats a lot of the times. What I found the best way to do that, it's a little exception to what I've talked about, is don't compress the full body cape into a big chunk of mush. Basically lay it out flat first, have the head up on the top if the skull's still in the cape, and then lay that cape 
down in here, right? You're probably gonna have to fold it once over so it goes to the line of the back and then over and up here. Again, try to keep the weight up here. You can have the feet up here and have the fold here and have the, you know, the, the double weight of the head plus the feet and stuff up high. That's preferred. The, the one challenge with it is, is if you bunch up a mountain goat cape, there's so, or a full body cape, in other species the same way too, there's so much mush there up here, it's gonna rock back here, it's gonna end up going over here, it's gonna slough into your head, slough to the side. When it comes to rams, they can be really tricky because of the weight of that head, and there's not a clear attachment point, okay? So you gotta get the ram's head up here as snug as possible and snug it down. It's tricky because there's not a whole lot to hold on there, onto there that's not slick and curved. You know, their horns are curved, so there's not a whole lot of ways to securely get that down, but you'll figure out the main thing is high and then as close to your head as possible. And in these pictures coming up, you're gonna see different variations of Rams pack and you're gonna see the good and the bad and the ugly. Mule deer are easy, guys. I'll show you a couple pictures on them. You know, they're usually not that heavy. So again, just up high, no problem. Elk, the way to do it is the bottom jaw facing you, antlers down, okay? The problem with big bulls, when you get them on your pack, is they wanna rock forward, right? The whale tails wanna walk forward. You know, they wanna walk like this way. So the whale tails wanna go like this, this way up. And what, what happens when you do that is the head and the heavy part of the antlers, the nose and everything wants to peel this way. And that gets that weight way out here. And that's one of the things we talked about earlier you wanna avoid. So on big bulls where you have those whale tails wanting to come forward on you like that, the best thing to do is kind of just how like we do it when we pack a mule is get a stick here, a trekking pole, you know, your tripod, something across your pack and get it under those beams. So what, what that does is if you've got the jaw of the elk like this, it's gonna go forward, right? It's gonna move it forward and a lot of the weight in a bull head and antlers, particularly if you've got the cape on it, a lot of the weight is right here around the skull and close to the skull. So you want that tipped forward. You don't want it tipped back like this. And those big bulls, that tends to be what they want to do. Those whale tails go like that. So you want to have a way to get that head forward on your pack. And the best way to do that is just have a barrier here that pulls those beams up. I'm gonna jump into the voiceover of these pictures. I think you get a ton out of it. We'll go through all these species in details. And like I said, you're gonna see the good, bad, and the ugly. I didn't do it perfect every time. I learned over the years and it's just hard, right? It's real world situations. So hopefully you guys learn from these, check it out. All right, so this is a mountain goat pack out in the Maroon Bells. It's kind of interesting to look at these pictures because I remember it being so much steeper than how it looks in these pictures. But, uh, but anyways, you can see here, it's a full body cape and then there's a little meat in that pack too. So uh, as I mentioned before, the, the way I do full body capes is I, I run them the whole backboard of the pack frame uh, in between the bag and the pack frame uh, head on top. In this case, the skull is inside the goat, so there's still a fair amount of weight up high. You can see here, the four feet are actually hanging down low. That's okay, but they do like dangle and flop. If you can actually get them under the pack and snug them down under the pack, that's best. That whole, that, you know, a big full body cape like that, particularly a goat where there's a lot of hair on it, it's just, it's just mushy and wants to slip around. So, all right, so here's a ram. This is one of my guides uh, with this ram on his pack. This is actually a fairly well-packed ram, okay? So you can see he's got meat in the actual bag of his pack. As I, I mentioned, you can do that. Now, ram's heads, you can see how the ram's head's a little tilted. I think I actually have another shot of this, this particular pack out. But ram's heads, because of their horns, how they're shaped, they're really hard to get a hold of and snug down real tight. Uh, the weight is concentrated in them, so that makes them easy to pack, but the fact that you don't have anything to grab down on and cinch down, it, uh, it can be a little bit difficult. But he's got this ram packed pretty well, up high, it's tilted back. You know, if the ram's nose was tilted up a little bit higher and the, and the horns were pulled around and centered, that would be ideal. But you can see here, he's basically got one strap to strap it down, so that's hard to do. If he had another strap that could go up and across the other side of the nose, he could probably straighten out that ram's head and have it perfect. That pack's pretty darn full of, uh, full of meat there. That's, I'm sure that was a heavy pack. And uh, he's not a very big guy. He's probably like 130 pounds, but tough as nails, man. I've done a bunch of pack outs with him. All right, so uh, this picture is just a little bit of goat country, uh, you know, kind of show you how steep that stuff is. Uh, we packed this 
uh, goat out actually in our packs, shoved it all in our packs. I think I have some images of that. Okay, yeah, so this is, this is that goat. Um, we packed it up, uh, meat in one pack uh, for the most part. I think I've got a quarter behind that cape, but you can see the same thing here. Uh, head on top, skull on top, the uh, cape all the way down. It's astonishing how long and dangly full body capes are, and that goes for deer, elk, whatever. But even on elk, you know, normal capes, you know, if you cape them conservatively and you have a lot, a long cape on them, a lot of times still you're gonna have to let that cape go down and then fold it back up. You'll still have, uh, you know, your weight distribution up high, but if you get those too thick, and you try to crank down on them, particularly if you have meat or other gear in your pack, it won't work. There's just too, it's just too soft, and over a pack out, that stuff is going to move around and cause you problems. You have to, you have to reset it. Okay, here's a ram on a client's back. Sometimes you end up having to pack rams out like this, and it's not ideal because they're actually, you know, they're actually fairly low on the pack. Um, and the other thing is, is they get way off your back, right? And I think I have another angle of this. On anything, on all this meat, gear, whatever, as I mentioned, you want to keep the weight as close to your, the actual frame of your pack and your actual back as possible. You can pack rams out like this. It tends to be easier to keep them centered because there's straps on the you know mid part of your backpack. So you can strap uh, the ram on like this. These ram heads will pack better on the top, as I mentioned, but you got to kind of have a pack that has structure up there. So... That's uh, one going. Not not the worst. Um, it's centered and stuff. It'll, it'll get out, but uh, it's better if you can get those heads up high. Here's this, here's another example of that. In this case, it's me. You can see this. This is kind of a disaster of a of a load, and I recall it being that way. I'll critique the heck out of this. So one, the weight's way down low. You can see there's meat under this this cape and ram's head and it's down like on my hips. This is a horrible case of like loaded diaper that I've got going on here. This was a really heavy, heavy load. Uh, I packed this ram out by myself actually. Um, the client had, had some some physical problems, great guy, but um, you know, didn't didn't have a ton of ability to help me uh, pack, pack the ram out. Um, fun hunt, great guy, but really a brutal pack out. So the critique here beyond the fact that I have meat way low on my hips, is I could have turned that ram's nose to the air and gotten it way up there closer to my load lifters and the top of that pack frame. I just, to be honest on this this particular hunt, I was completely exhausted. I actually remember it, it's pretty funny because there's a couple of funny stories related to this hunt. One, when I was coming down, this, it was the second load, I believe, it could have been this load actually, because um, I think I, I took out meat only on the first load. I was coming down and I could have sworn I ran into like the biggest porcupine I had ever seen in this little draw, like a little marshy draw in the timber. And what's funny is I actually got my phone out and I like videotaped like a selfie version of like, hey, look at this porcupine I'm, I'm seeing. And then I went back later on and looked at that video and there's no porcupine. I literally think I got to the point of exhaustion where I was partially like delusional. Um, and I don't, I don't know that that porcupine was there. So I have to kind of laugh a little bit up. You can get super exhausted on these these pack outs um, and that obviously exposes you to like physical injury just flopping around not staying coordinated that sort of thing but I also think sometimes you got to be real careful about your your mental state right if you get too tired dehydrated or whatever you can make poor decisions anyways that's that pack out a lot of a lot of poor things going on there and you can see just how brutal that is I mean this is a great example of just uh, stupidity uh, other than my smile everything else is wrong in this <laughs> in this on this pack out all right, so this is what I would call like a perfectly packed uh, ram's head. You can see essentially the butt of the curls of the horns are right against uh, my client's, uh, the back of their head, right against where the load lifter is attached to the pack. It can see the majority of the weight is up high on his back. So this is what I would be call as close to perfect as possible. He's got some, um, he's got some tenderloins and back straps down below the head and the cape. Um, but still, most of the weight is up high. That's just a side picture of how I haul capes. A lot of mountain goat pictures in here, guys. Um, I think there's just I ended up taking a lot of picture of those pictures of those over the years. Um, so there's a lot of examples on that. But they can apply to almost all all species. But you can see basically how that whole cape goes down the pack frame. 
All right, so here's two of my old guides packing out a pretty big bull, and they're actually packing this bull down to get it on some mules and then pack it out of the wilderness area. All right, so this is actually a good depiction of one of the concepts that I talked about, and that's that you can see this big bull. He's got these big, long beams, and they're kicking out in front of Mark, right? And the reason that's bad is that you can see here very well that the weight of like the bull's nose and the cape that's attached to the bull there, it kicks way back off of Mark's uh, back, and that puts that weight way away uh, from his center of gravity, and it's really hard to pack this way. So the best way to improve this load would have been to kick these beams back, stick a trekking pole or something across the pack, where it caught you know, up the beams a third of the way and kept those antlers up away uh, from his from his ass there and, and kept that chin up closer to his head and that would keep the weight you know up between uh, between Mark's shoulders. Um, not a big cr critique. Mark is a freaking stud. Knows what he's doing. Uh, he's packed a bunch of meat out with me, um, but that would have been that would have improved this pack out and it gives you and this particular angle on it. Uh, gives you a great view of that uh, that concept. All right, so here's the uh, hate my life pose, just an example of it. Uh, here he's actually doing this client's actually doing it, uh, you know, pretty pretty well. He's not bent way over. This is going to be your intuition, guys, is to rest like this, and it's not a bad way to do it. Just make sure you don't bend over too far, where you hurt your back when you get up. Here you can see a quarter is between his pack and pack frame, snugged in there real tight. Uh, that's a pretty pretty good load. All right, here guys, I just put this in here because one thing I haven't mentioned in the video yet is that if you're, you know, if you're a guided client or if you're just hunting with buddies or whatever and you, there's no expectation of you helping out helping out with meat packing, I think it's still great for people to have even if it's a small pack, have a pack capable of packing meat. This guy's a great client. He hunted with me for years. Super good guy, older guy. So, you know, there's not this expectation that he's going to pack as much as the guys or whatever, and that's totally fine but he's always willing to pack some and that makes a big difference guys like if there's somebody in the group that you know really you know there's three or four guys and there's really not the expectation that one or two of them are going to pack meat but they're willing to take one shoulder or they're willing to take you know just the head and the cape something like that it's it's really it's really a huge deal and uh, guides really appreciate it so uh, just a thought guys and you can see here with his small pack it's kind of a nice day pack size but he can still fit a quarter in there. It's got it's got a nice uh, waist belt. Got it has load lifters and it has a nice little frame. So I just want to stick that in there. Here's me uh, on a pack out. You can see here, and this is just kind of an example, guys, of how well you can pack out meat inside the bag. Okay, so I had a couple elk quarters actually in here. I had a I had a hind quarter and a shoulder in this pack which is brutal for me. That's that's way more than I can, it's really more than I should be taking. Um, but you can see how tidy it is in that pack and you can see how most of the weight is behind my shoulders up to behind my head. Um, here also you can see my use of trekking poles. I've, I'm literally making contact with a trekking pole on each step. So every step I'm giving my knees relief. So that's that depicts those two concepts well. Here guys, you can see this is down. I'm actually, I think we're probably two thirds through this pack out. You can see that I have my load lifters cranked pretty tight and that has lifted to shoulder straps. And this is just a function of the fact that at this point, I'm moving the weight all over the place from my hips to my shoulders to different spots on my shoulders. And as that happens and as you do that, you're gonna have, uh, you know, non perfect fitting straps, right? So right here, basically, I've decided like, I don't want that goat pulling on me anymore on the back there. So I've cranked on those those load lifters and gotten all, all or a lot of the weight up on the front of my shoulders. And at that particular time, that's what felt best to me. So that's why you're seeing that rise above my shoulder blades. Yeah, this one I think is just funny. A uh, good guy that worked for me, he wanted to pack pack a uh, bull out uh, like this um, to the horses and then down. What I'll say about this, guys, is you actually see a lot of people pack like this in pictures and that sort of thing. And it goes contrary to what I said before about keeping the whale tails back behind your behind your ass so that uh, that uh, nose and stuff goes forward. On smaller bulls, you can just do this with your hands, and he's actually doing that. He's actually pushing on the, the tips of the beam, and that keeps that weight 
up uh, between his shoulders and high. But you'll see guys in pictures and YouTube videos and stuff pack, you know, they'll pack their pack with meat and then they'll just throw that elk, that elk's head up behind their head like this and they'll grab the beams and then they end up kind of bending at their hips and leaning over to keep all that weight behind their, their head. And it's not a bad way to do it, but I'm suspect that they're doing that for very long. Like I'm guessing that most of those packouts are like sub mile, you know, sub hour packouts, um, you know, sub 30, 40 minutes, that sort of thing. That works well. It's a handy way to do it. You don't have to deal with trying to strap the, uh, the bull's head to your pack, but it hurts. And the other thing about it is you're holding those beams all the time, so you're gonna have a really hard time getting water. You know, you're gonna have a hard time adjusting your pack, redistributing the weight. So it's not ideal. This picture kind of um, depicts what I'm talking about. I don't think it's the norm. It surely wasn't the norm for us if we were packing more than a mile, a couple miles. Um, but if we were doing short stuff, you know, holding an elk's head like this is actually pretty handy. All right, guys. Here you can see this is a great. Uh, this was a great pack out. I remember this goat actually, the hunter, the client here, he actually shot, ended up hitting the goat right in the face. But anyways, it was a bloody mess. It took took, uh, took quite a bit of uh, cleanup on a white goat to get the face cleaned up for pictures, but we got it done. But anyways, here you can see the use of the bag. Here I've got the goat up high. Um, everything is tight and there's quite a bit of weight in that, uh, that pack, but it's all tidy and this was a good load, I remember it, so. Okay, so here's another elk. Uh, it's not the best picture, guys, but you can see one of the ways to do this is we've got the, the elk's head is actually under the pack, and then you've got the pack strapped, strapped down on the bull, right? Antlers going down. In this case here, most of the weight is up high. The nose and the, and the lower chin is basically gonna be against the, uh, the, guide's, uh, the guide's head on the back of his head. So this is a good way to do this. It's tough, guys. I mean, you can see all the mush in there. You're for sure still going to have some weight hanging off, hanging off your back. But that gives you a little bit more of a angle of that pack out of a of a bull in its cape. I didn't have the whole mountain goat in this pack, but uh, I had the head, the cape, and then I had a couple of the quarters in here, and then I actually had camp. We actually pulled out camp that day. This was a brutal pack out. Um, I would say in general the pack was packed really well. Um, but the problem was, was is just too much weight, right? That pack's probably legitimately over a hundred pounds. It was only like a three mile pack out and it was all downhill. So it was bearable. This was in the maroon bells. And on these hunts, we would come out into trailheads that were super popular. So one of the added bonuses of packing meat in the pack or packing capes and heads in the pack is that it just didn't distract people, right? You could go into areas where there's a lot of tourists and people were always nice, even if they knew you were hunting. I never had problems in that regard. But when you've got an 80, 90, 100 pound pack on, kind of once you get to the last mile of the trail and you start running into people because they're kind of doing little day hikes in popular areas, you don't really want to stop and talk to people, right? It's not that they're conflictual with you about hunting or anything like that. A lot of people are just curious. But when you've got that weight on you, like the last thing you want to do is stop and bullshit with people. So a lot of times in those areas, I would pack game out like this. Here, just a mule deer example. They're easy, guys. Just get them up there high. Um, unless they're just weird and wild and non-typical, they're usually not too big of a deal. Way less weight. Their, their capes are way thinner than an elk. Not near as long, a lot easier to handle. You can keep most of it up high. Um, they're a pretty easy game animal to pack out, way less weight. But capes and stuff, horns, this is the way to do it right here. All right, guys, and I just threw this in here because this is how I prefer to pack all my meat out now, just on the back of horses and mules. It's uh, way uh, better. And just a note on that, uh, it kind of put that in here, in here as a little bit of a joke. In general, people way underestimate how hard it is to get bull elk out of the backcountry. And unfortunately, over the years, I ran into several situations where public land hunters had lost part of elk. Um, or the majority of elk because they killed them way too far in there and they weren't a big enough group to get the animal out quick enough uh, before it spoiled. This is particularly the case in September when most of the backpack hunting is going on, but it's archery season, it's a little bit warmer. It does happen, guys. Guys don't talk about it, but I just put it out there as a warning. You have to be, know you're capable of packing these big animals out on your back 
that's a duty you have when you're planning to make sure you can get them out. You don't want to waste meat like that. That is very much a travesty when that happens. And usually it's one or two guys, okay, so they don't have extra help and they've gone too far in. And sometimes it's in mild country, like they're going in with their packs, they get in, get in there seven, eight, nine, ten 10 miles, and then they kill something and it might be downhill, they gotta bring it out of a drawer or something and then pack it out, and they're just physically not capable of doing it within you know, 24, 48 hours. Um, bigger groups do better, they all stop hunting. You know, If there's four or five guys, they can all stop hunting and get the animal out, um, but that's what it takes. I've seen a lot of guys talk about you know, how they pack in solo seven, eight, nine, ten 10 miles. You're getting yourself in a really brutal situation, just so you know, um, but that's all personal decision, just, just think about it out there. So anyways, guys, I hope those were useful, useful examples for you. All right, guys, so let's talk about how to actually get these heavy packs on you. This is when a guy's typically gonna get hurt, right? When he's actually getting the pack on him. And it's usually not gonna be the first time you put it on, right? When you have energy, you're not super worn out yet. That's usually not when you're gonna hurt yourself. Usually when you're gonna hurt yourself is when you do inevitably stop, take the pack off, and then get it back on once you're already exhausted. That's when a lot of guys screw their backs up, you know, trip and fall, smash their face in, that sort of thing. So figure out different techniques. You know, you're gonna think it's overkill when you first put the pack on, but as you get fatigued, having proper technique is gonna make a big difference. I'm cheating here, guys. This is only like a 55, 60 pound pack, but when you get into 80, 90, 100 pound packs, you really need to be careful. And ideally, you got somebody to help you, okay? But if you've gotta do it by yourself, I'll show you a couple moves. Um, generally, the best way, like the overarching concept, the best way to get a pack on is to get it while you're standing, right? While you're upright, get it on your back while you're upright. So if you've got help, have people hold it up for you and just basically mount into it. That's the best way to do it. You know, go in there standing, then you don't have to worry about that back bend and all that stuff where people get hurt. But if you're doing it by yourself, one way to do it standing is just get the pack here by both straps, okay? Get it up on your knee and as high as possible, right? As high as possible, and then you're gonna shrug it up with your back upright. You're gonna shrug it up and then dip in and basically underhook in here and get a uh, shoulder strap, okay? So you're gonna just pump up in. Now you've got one strap on. I got both hands on it here. I can shift over to one and thread into the other, okay? That's a nice, safe way to do it. The reality is if you're by yourself, once you get into like 75, 80 pounds, it's pretty hard to do that because it's not a perfectly solid chunk of weight. So that thing swings around and it can be really tricky. So one trick you can do is you can actually do this concept, but you want to do it against a tree. When you do this, you're going to set it against a tree, right? And that's going to hold it a bit for you as you swing in and get in here and turn, okay? So that's a good upright way to do it. So let's talk about some scenarios that are not ideal, but you're probably gonna end up in. And that's, you just can't knee hike up the pack and get underneath it, like I just showed you. So you're basically gonna have to get on the pack on the ground and then get up with the pack. First, I'll show you what you shouldn't do. A lot of guys will do this, and I've seen guys get hurt this, this way. They'll lay the pack down, right? They'll lay into it this way. All right, like this, they'll strap up here just like this with their back kind of hyperextended. And then what they'll do is they'll just try to swing forward like this, and just tough it out and go forward, right? This is probably the number one way to hurt your back getting up with one of these heavy packs, guys. Just swinging forward, okay? The best solution in terms of your back to mitigate problems there is to keep your back straight like a proper, proper squat. That's very difficult because this pack is on the ground. You get into it, right? You're gonna do a goblet squat with 100 pounds on your back. Most people can't even do that, but it's also gonna be super harder on your knees, right? Balance and everything, so that's not really realistic. So what a lot of guys will do as an alternative is they'll get the pack on them, they'll lay into it like I just showed you, like this, okay? And then they'll roll, right? And they'll roll this way, and then they'll do a horrible squat up, okay? Just kind of like this, bag over their head, and uh, okay? Again, not ideal, good way to hurt your back. So 
The better way to do that, and it looks goofy, but the better way to do that is just with a little help. So I'll show you that. So I'm gonna find a log with a little elevation like this, drag my pack over to it, right? Set it on the log like this, where it's easy to get into. Get down in here. Ideally, if you can get your belt on there, it'll kind of help <clears throat> your balance. As you get up, you don't have to get it crazy tight. We can do that once we're up, but use that to hold your pack so you get in here. You're, it's not a weird, weird way to get in comfortable. Roll in here, okay? Even with a heavy pack, this is fairly easy. And then use something to help yourself get up so you can maintain that, you know, your, your back posture, okay? So use this, okay? And then usually what I do is just a little forward momentum, okay? That's a lot easier, keeps your back nice and straight and you'll get up properly. Um, that's usually how I do it, probably 99% of the time. I find a structure to get into, roll into that kind of, you know, belly down position, then use that structure to crawl up and get to my feet. If I'm by myself or I don't have help or I'm the last guy getting my pack on, that's how I'm gonna do it, guys. So that last one, guys, I do that probably 80, 90% of the time when I actually have a pack that's more than 65, 70 pounds. Just roll to all fours, use some sort of structure, a rock, you know, a stump, something to help myself crawl up with forward momentum so I'm not arching my back, you know, like an idiot and getting my back hurt, okay? So I use that mostly. I feel so weird demonstrating it on camera, and I'm sure I look goofy up in the mountains doing it too. But anyways, guys, I'm sure there's a bunch of you out there that have your own strategy to safely get on a really heavy pack. Everybody's got a different body type. They've had different experiences. So I'm sure you've got some good ideas. So please, if you do, guys, leave it in the comments so everybody can check it out. Not everybody's gonna be the same, and there's probably a ton of other ways to get up safely with a super heavy pack. Now some strategic advice that I have seen many, many, many folks overlook, particularly in Colorado. In 70 to 80% of situations, packouts can be 90% downhill if people know the area well or they do some due diligence. You can get into trouble if you start downhill and get cliffed out in the dark. That can be a really miserable experience. A lot of people understand that concept and they're fearful of it. So what they do a lot of the time is they end up packing up out of basins into the original basin they came in via, right? When you have a heavy meat pack, that's brutal. And it's even more brutal once you get down and you look back up or the next day you look at the map and you realize you could go out the bottom. So here's my last piece of advice. While it's light out and you have your all and X with tons of trails, old and new, figure out the downward exits from any basin you plan on going into. This is before you do stocks, before you kill anything, before you go into a basin, look at the exit routes that go out the bottom, even if you have no plan beforehand to do so, right? Your camp's up high or whatever, and you're gonna go back to it. Still think about where those exits out the bottom of the basin are. In anywhere that's been mined, you know, had traffic over the years, in a lot of these basins, even super remote stuff in Colorado and other western states, a lot of the times there's a route at the bottom that you can figure out before you go into that basin. A lot of the times what I'll do is I'll actually glass that route before I go in there. If, I, if we're going to go in to chase a bull, a buck, a ram, or a billy, or whatever, before we crawl in the basin, I'll glass the face of it and see if there's a route at the bottom. I know of at least seven to eight times that doing that has saved me 500 to 1,000 foot climb and hours with a heavy pack on. For all you guys out there, if you have any advice for guys packing out meat, leave it in the comments. I hope everybody on this channel has this experience this season, but all you guys are a treasure tro trove of knowledge, and I'm just covering what has worked for me in this video. I know there are some other great tips out there for people, so please leave them in the comments, guys, so people can check them out. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out, guys. Good luck out there, and thanks.